Good morning. Good morning. Good day. Welcome to those of you that are in this room and those of you that are joining us via the internet, whether it's by television, screens, radio. We're happy to have you joining us and I am grateful to God that he has delivered me from religion, he has delivered me from religiosity, he has delivered me from the traditions of men. Because after I got born again, and I know something genuinely had happened to me, I eventually walked away from that true experience and started to adapt to the traditions of men. And it started creating a conflict because when a person is truly touched by God and anything that is contrary to that begins to come in, the Spirit of God in you will not allow you to feel at peace, at ease, accepting anything that is contrary to who God is. I, couldn't, I could not define what it was till after a while. It took me a while. I struggled. And I got to the point of understanding that I could not continue to receive what was being offered where I was. And even though I didn't want to leave, I know eventually that I had to because they had no intention of changing. They had no intention of giving up their traditions. They believe that they are pleasing God. They believe that they're doing the will of God in what they're doing, so therefore they would not let it go. And I'm so glad that in spite of the struggle or whatever it is, that God allowed me to come to the place of walking away from it. And I am free. And today, we see a church that continues to guard the traditions of men and continue to guard the very culture of the world, the nation that they are a part of, as I said yesterday in our fasting meeting. Um, one of the things that I see have happened where the church is concerned, the church have walked away from its purpose in God. Because when we look at Matthew chapter 16, it is clear about what Jesus said and what the Father did even in the moment when he asked the apostles the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And God was the one, God the Father gave Peter the revelation that he was the Christ and he was the Son of the living God. Jesus said, because of this revelation that you have now received, upon this revelation I am building my church. So the church must continue to represent that truth, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, because that's what the church is built on. And Jesus said to Peter that the gates of hell is going to come against that. The gates of hell is going to come against that and also work in opposition to what that truth is. But it will not prevail. Once we hold on to the truth, it will not prevail. It will not, it cannot prevail. And when you look at what has happened, Jesus clearly states, what the church is supposed to be representing. The church is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not the church. The church is given, given the keys to the kingdom. Therefore, the church is supposed to be operating in the authority and the power of the kingdom. The church is a representation of who Christ is. And if you're representing another you have to stay in alignment with that person or that thing that you're representing. The moment you take yourself away from it, you're no longer a representative. You're no longer a representative. If you think about it naturally, an ambassador is appointed, like even for Canada, based on the constitution, the prime minister is the one who has the authority to appoint an ambassador. So they do their vetting and they choose this individual to be the ambassador from Canada 
to the United States of America, to Jamaica, to Germany, and wherever they would have their ambassadors are. The ambassador knows if that person didn't understand what being an ambassador is, they're going, to, they're going to explain it to them, and they're going to give them the necessary tools for them to understand. You are not going to go out there and represent yourself. That's when you listen to an ambassador talking. When you listen to an ambassador talking, it doesn't matter what. They never give their opinion. Because you are not representing yourself. You give your opinion when you are representing yourself. Are you hearing me? Because a lot of preachers even in the pulpit, time and time again I hear them say it. In my opinion, you need to step away. You're not here to give God's people your opinion. You're here to give God's people what God gives you. And what I want to show you in this, anytime we see an ambassador, because I remember when I came to Canada, shortly after we started the, the ministry, there was an ambassador, I believe he was in England from Canada here, and he got involved in giving his opinion about certain things that was happening. You remember what they did? I don't know if you remember, they recalled him, then bring him home. Because once you give your opinion, you are no longer an ambassador. So come out your yard and be an ordinary citizen. God established the church for his purposes. Not for you. Not for man. Not for the world. For his purposes. If you do not understand what that means, get understanding. Because there are those whom God has appointed. There are those whom God has appointed. And he literally endued them with wisdom and knowledge and understanding in the things concerning who he is and what he is about. That when they speak to you, they are never speaking from their opinion. And if you are of God and the Spirit of God is in you, when they speak to you, you will know if they're speaking from God or not. You remember what the Bereans did? How did they know that what they heard from the apostles was so? They search the scriptures daily. What I am saying to you, have you been searching the scripture to see that what Bobby Summers is saying, it is so? No, you're not. Because you think I'm making this up. You think it's not in the scripture. It's there. And a lot of you will never see it until you hear me. Because you have been reading the scripture for years and you cannot see certain things. Because of how, you, how your mind has been programmed. So until you hear me, when you hear me now, you go and you look. And you see that, it, wow, it has been there all the time. I'm saying all of that to say this, that for those of you who are coming inside here and those of you that are joining us online, I am not a part of the circus. It's, it, it literally sick my stomach as I was listening to the book of Revelation yesterday evening when I, was, when I got home. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, when Jesus told John that he should write to the seven churches in Asia, known as Asia Minor. Those churches would have existed in the region that is now known today as modern-day Turkey. Tourists, those, those areas now it become a tourist attraction. So people go there, and so this is where, you know, the church of Ephesus was. Church of Smyrna, the Church of Philadelphia, and all of these things. We see what God said through his son Jesus to the apostle John. You see what he said about the church in Ephesus. You see what he said about the church in Tyateria. And the church in Laodicea, the church in Laodicea, they say that they were rich and they have need of nothing. The church, you know, you imagine that. The church is saying 
that they are rich and they have need of nothing. When you start to talk like that, you're no longer representing God. Notice, we are rich. We are rich and we have need of nothing. Jesus says, you are poor, you are blind, you are wretched, and you are naked. You remember what he told them to come and buy from him? And the buying is not about money. The buying, if you notice in Isaiah chapter 55, come buy wine without price and without money. How do you buy without money? And Jesus Christ did what he did where those seven churches are concerned for the present church today even to understand how we're supposed to operate. One of the church allowed a woman that possessed by the spirit of Jezebel who called herself a prophetess to prophesy to them and lead his people into fornication. Look at the present state of the church today. Everything that we read in those seven churches, it's in the present church today. There's a lot of females that are driven by the spirit of Jezebel and take on apostle, take on all kind of title, and people, people are sitting down and allow that Jezebel spirit to be spewed into them and lead you. Once you listen to a person... And you receive from them. And if it's not from God, it's going to take you away from God. So when you listen to me, if you are listening to me, when you listen to me, if you're listening to me, am I bringing you closer to God, to the things of God, or am I leading you astray? Am I taking you back into Egypt? Am I, leading, am I leading you into idolatry? Am I taking you away from the living God and leading you to God's? Those of you that are born again in this room, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. Yesterday in our fasting meeting before we pray, and that's exactly the same thing that I'm going to be doing today. It's not going to be the same as yesterday, but I want you to listen very carefully. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said some things that we ought to really stop. Stop, stop, hear them, really hear them, receive them, and give ourselves to the Spirit to bring us into those things. Jesus spoke about from verse 1 to about verse 8. Jesus spoke about three things that is important for the church to do. They're supposed to become disciplines for the church. Uh, I'm going to ask you, let go of each other hand for the moment, please. And I want you to listen to me, please. You can hold it again another time, but at this moment, I just want you to be free. Listen to me. Number one... Jesus talked about giving. He says, when you give, this is how you're supposed to give. Uh, because every single person in Christ, we're supposed to be givers. We're supposed to be givers. Anytime you find that you're, you, you don't, you're not free to give, you need to check yourself. You do not have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is a giving spirit. For God so loved the world that he withhold, he gave. 
Jesus said, I am come that you might have. And in order for you to have it, I have to give it. Jesus said to the apostles in, in Matthew chapter 10, he said, freely you receive, freely you give. When you refuse to give, you believe that what you have, you didn't receive it. And God can never trust you when you refuse to give. And while we are all supposed to give, there are those of us that God even go a little further and actually give us a gift that is known as giving. In Romans chapter 12, there is a gift. There are some of us that have that gift. We will give the shirt off our back. So it's a part of being in the kingdom, giving. Number two, he talks about fasting. That's a discipline that every one of us is supposed to be a part of. And he tells us, when you give, you remember when it's, what he said? When you give, do not be, do not be like the... Because they love to give. Watch this now. Notice, notice something here. They're not giving because it's, it's, they have the heart to give. They give because they want to be seen. Notice what motivate they're giving. Number two, fasting. He says, when you fast, do not do it like who? You remember? Because they disfigured their faces. They don't wash their faces. They, they leave themselves in a way that when you see them, you know that they are fasting. So what is their motive? They're doing it to be seen. Number three, the three things that Jesus talked about, and that's where we are going here now. We're going to pray. And we're taking these things for joke. We're taking these things lightly. Prayer is a very, very important part of our life in God. It is a communication medium in the spirit where you are able to hear God speaking to you. Anytime, anywhere. It's not so much about you speaking. It's about God speaking. But Jesus also addressed it for us to understand that you can't just get up and pray as you feel, as you think. Because he said, do not pray like the hypocrites. Notice, because they love. Notice, you know, and, 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 and as I stood there, the Holy Spirit said, a lot of us, we love to pray. We're not supposed to be in love with prayer. You're supposed to be in love with God. When you're in love with something, it replaces God. So in many of our lives, prayer has become idolatry. Jesus said they love to pray. Standing in the synagogues to be seen. He said the even, they, watch this, they think, they think by their much speaking. Some people in the church, you pray and say two words in your prayer and say amen, and they will never receive it. Because we, we develop this thing where we have to pray and we have to ball and we have to ah, ah. And the way we are behave as if we are not a son and we have to labor for God to really turn and pay any little attention to it. The way how we behave in our attitude, what we call prayer, the way we behave, come on people. Now tell me that if God tell you, that listen to me, God said, call unto me and I will answer. He invited you to come. And he said, while you are yet speaking, I will. 
So why me I fear? Oh God, and Lord God, and Jesus, and Jesus, and, and we are gone, and we are gone, and we are gone. And not until I believe, watch this, until I am satisfied that, you know, I have said enough and I have done enough, then I, I, I feel just, I notice our prayers are never answered because God is not responding to that foolishness. Imagine my son wanting something to eat and he has to come and daddy or mommy, please, I beg you, I am hungry and can you give me something to eat? Please, please, please. If you have to do that as a child, what parents, God, our Heavenly Father, even draw. He draws. He, 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 there, there's a comparison. Watch this. He says, if your earthly fathers, who are evil by nature, know how to give good gift to their children. He said, if the child come and asks for a bread, he said, would they give them a stone? If they ask for fish, would they give them, if they ask for a egg, would they give them a scorpion? He says, no. How, watch this, how much more? We need to change our mindset. Please, I beg of you today. We are at a juncture where we need to see people praying. And the very moment you pray, I mean the heavens shift. And you know, if you're dead, they are labor. Oh, God. Oh, God. Come on. We never see nobody in Scripture pray like that. Not even with Lord Jesus Christ. He stood up at the grave of Lazarus and he said, Father, I know you always hear me. But because of the people standing. And notice he never going on a long labor. After he said it, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Didn't Lazarus come forth? Didn't Lazarus come forth? I want us to be delivered from the prior of religion. Many of us are coming out of certain homes where we hear our grandmother pray. Sir. A lot of these people, I am not putting them down and, and talk about speak heal of the dead. We need to speak the truth. A, a lot of our grandparents and whoever we grew up say, say to them are Christian. Their, their prayers were hardly ever answered. But they were, they, they were devoted, you know, they were sincere. But they weren't getting any answer. But we believe that I need to pray. I need to pray. So we do the things we do. Based on what I'm teaching on starting last week, and I'll continue on it this week. Boy, even this morning when I thought about it and the Holy Spirit began to show me some things, I, I was saying, Holy Spirit, what is, it, what is this that I have done? But I didn't do it. I open up something that I thought I would be able to do in just one session or whatever and then go back to continue with the truth. But the truth is that where faith is concerned, it is so important for you to receive whatever I'm teaching even about truth. And if we don't get it, we're going to keep on rejecting what we ought to receive. In James chapter 5, I want you to please listen to this one more time. Because how the mindsets that have been developed, however we develop them, whether we get them from our grandparents, our uncle, our mother, or whatever, and we became part of we became part of denominations that these are the things that we saw and heard and we thought that it was right. However, we develop these things, we've got to use the truth of the word to destroy them. If you do not do that, it's going to destroy you. Strongholds, strongholds are meant to imprison you. And wherever you have a stronghold, you have a strong man. Wherever you have, and I ask those of you that are born again to stand up. I do not want you to continue to practice lies. Because some of you are standing up right now and you're not born again. 
Don't come inside here and pretend that you know God and you don't know God. You may experience a little bit of whatever, but you, you, are, not, you are not committed to God. Wherever there is a stronghold, there is a strong man. Jesus says, in order for you to destroy the strong man's goods, you pass him, tell him good morning, and say, you know, I'm here today to destroy your goods. Can you show me where you have them? You remember what Jesus said you have to do? You first must, you first must bind up the strong man. And if Satan is the strong man, how does Satan build strongholds in your life? He does not go to Home Depot or Rona or Home and Hardware and buy materials and come and build a stronghold. The material that Satan uses to build strongholds, it's called lies. So now, if he's the strong man, and he's the father of lies. How do you bind the strong man who is the father of lies? What is the rope that you use to bind the strong man who is the father of lies? You, anybody remember growing up? I, I still sometimes look at those things. But you remember growing up and watching the Super Friends? Anybody remember the Super Friends? And then after that, we had the Justice League. We have Superman, we have Batman, we have Wonder Woman, we have Green Lantern. I, I want to talk about Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman has an invisible jet. I don't know how she finds it when she needs to fly. But she has an invisible jet. And secondly, Wonder Woman has a lasso. And it's called the lasso of truth. That when they want somebody to tell the truth, she lasso them. Hallelujah. Can I use that weak analogy and say, if you're going to defeat the strong man, you've got to know truth. And you take out your truth and you lasso him and you tie him up. And he has no, listen, he has no option but to surrender to the truth. Because remember, the truth is God. The truth is the word. The truth is the spirit. So those strongholds that has been established in our mind, it's not going to go away. You can't think it away. You can't pray it away. Because if you're praying and not praying according to truth, it remains. Hear what the scripture says. Is anyone among you suffering? Let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let him pray. And let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil in the authority from the position of the Lord. And the prior of faith will, the prior of faith will, the prior of faith will. Are you, are you getting it? Are you asking yourself the question, what is the prior of faith? The Bible says it. So what is the prior faith? What does that mean? What does that look like? He said, and the prior faith will save the sick. It doesn't matter the disease. It doesn't matter the sickness. It doesn't matter what. Once the prior faith is prayed and the person that is sick receive it, it will save the sick. That if there's anything wrong with your joints, immediately. Any organ, immediately. I'm not asking you. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16. Confess your faults, your trespasses to one another. Confess your trespasses to one another. 
Oh, boy, we call ourselves the church, you know. We call ourselves the church. We are the church. As a matter of fact, let me take that back. We do not call ourselves the church. We go to church. And because we are not seeing ourselves as the church, we're operating the way we are. Because this is something that is given to the church. It's a part of the culture that was created by the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. That when we are fellowshipping and in love, we're not afraid to confess our faults to one another. We're not afraid to confess our trespasses to one another. Because when you're doing that in love, the one who is confessing it, you confess it out of love. The one who you're confessing it to, they're hearing it out of love. And notice, out of love, you pray one for another. You, you don't hear that with gossip in your mind. That what? And then you're now looking who you can tell about that. No, love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Lo love doesn't search for gossip. Love search to be healed. Love search to be delivered. Love search to bring freedom. So you share something with me and it covered with love. And I'm responding out of love to pray for you with such sincerity and with such heart that it's touching the very pulse of God. That whatever the situation that you confess, immediately it's dismantled. But if you notice, we don't practice such things because love is only mentioned from our lips among each other. But it's nowhere to be found in action. So we come to meetings Sunday after Sunday and there's a lot of things that is undermining us. And it's there and God said you need to confess it. You need to confess it. Because God allowed that to be. Watch this. God allowed that to be. He, he, he could just remove everything. But he allowed it to be to build a community. When you think we will ever practice, they did it, they practiced it in the book of Acts. When you think the present church today will ever practice these things. So we continue to delay the return of the Lord. We continue to push it back, push it back, push it back, push it back. Because we're getting further and further away from truth. We're drifting further and further away from what God wants us to come into. And, and we continue to push back. The creation continues to grain, groan and travail. And we continue to push back the desire of the creation. Because the creation is waiting for sons of God. Waiting for the manifestation of sons of God. And so we keep putting, we keep, we keep, we keep, we keep allowing the creation to remain longer in the bondage that it is in, that it shouldn't be in wherever you are. Because once you step into your sonship, wherever you are, creation is free. You notice when Jesus hung on the cross, and, 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 and that's not the only time, but that, that, that was one of the most intense moments. Notice when Jesus hung on the cross, how creation was behaving. Notice when Jesus hung on the cross, how creation was behaving. The sun didn't come out. The earth started quaking. Darkness covered the earth for a long period of time. Why? Because the Son of God is dying and the creation the behavior of the creation in that moment was a testimony that this is indeed the son of god that notice notice another part of the creation that got the revelation the centurion who gave the order for him to be crucified after the darkness, after the earthquake, he himself now got a revelation. And remember what was his confession? Of a truth. This ah Rimondo Kosatayaba. Of a truth. That's not something written for us just to memorize it. It is still happening. Creation is still groaning. Creation is still anticipating the people of God that is getting true teachings to take, to assume your position as a son without any shame. Doesn't matter what anybody want to think or say. 
You're here to serve the purposes of God. And God said, I don't want you as a Christian. I don't want you as a Baptist. I want you as a son. Forgive me if I sound a bit loud and sound like I'm cussing and sound like I'm hungry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Confess your trespasses or your faults to one another. And pray for one another. If you, if, you, if you think about it, I don't want to labor too long on this, but, but as I'm reading it again, this comes back to me now. In the Old Testament, Israel had to go to the priests to offer the sacrifice. When certain sin was committed, they had to go to the priest. Even if a person got the plague called leprosy, They had to go to the priest, and the priest had to examine them. And if they were a leper, they would be isolated, and the priest would check them after so many days to see if there is any changes. And when they are cleansed, it was the priest who approved them being cleansed and restored them. That's why when the leper under the law, Jesus was still under the law because it's after he died on the cross, things shifted. Under the law, when the leper, even when Jesus cleansed the leper, Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest as a testimony. Now, we see the false priesthood that is established by the Catholic Church. So if you're a Catholic, you go and you confess to the priest. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been 54 days since my last confession. <laughs> okay? And based on the, 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 the magnitude of your sin, the Father, the priest would now tell you how many penance, how many heal Mary you need to do, and so on and so forth. Am I right, my dear? Okay. Now, in the New Testament, you don't need to go to, watch this, watch this. You yourself is now a priest because you are a royal priesthood. So if you notice, God said, confess your faults one to another. So you are confessing to an, a priest, and another priest is receiving that. And notice, and he says, in your position as a priest, you now pray for one another. And when you pray for one another, because it's a priest confessing, it's a priest receiving, and a priest can't praying. And so when you pray in that order, you say, you shall be healed. You shall be healed. The addiction must be broken. This is the part that I want to get to and I'll stop and we pray. I hope you can hear me now. After the scripture said all of what it says from verse 13 coming down to verse 16. Notice, notice. It's not just you just praying. There is a position from which you must pray. There is a position from which you must pray. And if you, if you reject your position, if you ignore your position, if you doubt your position, do not pray. Because if you pray, it's religion. It will never go anywhere. We keep overlooking these things. Notice, after he said everything that is not now, he said the effective, fervent prayer. Watch this. 
Watch your position. Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. So who is God? Who? Some of you need to sit down in this room right now. Who is God expecting to communicate with him and he will receive your communication? How many of you, and I know you're going to really just let's say, I believe that I'm righteous. When? Because I'm saying it right now and you want to cover yourself and cover your pride. Because it's pride why some of you will not sit down back right now. Because you're not in the position to pray in this room right now. But because of your pride, you're going to remain standing. And your prayer will not even go up and touch the, 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 the light bulb. It's not going to take off from the earth. Because God is serious about this. No sinner can pray to God. God does not have pleasure in sin. God does not find pleasure in wickedness. So therefore, God has done everything that he can do to make sure that you can approach him from a position of righteousness. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, it says, come with timidity. Come fearful. Come wishing and hoping that maybe God might. He said, come boldly. For you to come boldly, you've got to know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Righteousness give you boldness. In Proverbs, in Proverbs, it says the righteous is bold as what? A lion. Righteousness, sin make you a coward. Ask Adam when he sinned, when God showed up, where was he? Hiding. Righteousness gives you boldness and you come into the presence of your father with confidence, knowing who you are, knowing whose you are, and you communicate with him with authority and know that when you speak to your father, the answer is already there before you even finish saying what you're saying. Come on, come on, come on. Scripture says you come boldly knowing that we have a high priest that cannot, watch it, he can be touched with the feelings of your infirmity. But we're coming, I'm not worthy. Some of us even, we always start our prayer, Father, I am not worthy. Then if you're not worthy, what are you What are you doing at the throne if you're not worthy? Because you have to be worthy to gain access to the throne. And once you gain access to the throne and the king extend his scepter to you, whew, the king extend his scepter to you. Esther have not been called by the king for 30 days, but there is a situation that requires a urgent action. And she said, if I die, I die, but I must see the king. You remember when they pushed the door open? By law, anybody who go before the king without the king calling for you, death is the consequence. But she said, if I die, I die. What saved Esther life? When the door was open and the Bible said when the king saw her, she found favor in the eyes of the king. And immediately, the king took the golden scepter and stretched it. You see when he stretched it out? The bodyguard and everybody have to step back because what the king is saying... What the king is saying. God has made us sons. He has made us king. And he said, come boldly. Come. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. In this moment, if God wants your prayer to be a prayer of praise, then go ahead. If God wants your prayer to be a prayer of thanksgiving, then go ahead. If God wants your prayer to be a prayer of intercession, go ahead. If God wants your prayer to be a prayer of supplication, go ahead. Go ahead and approach the throne. Go ahead and approach the throne. Approach the throne. Approach the throne. You have access. You have a right. Because of the blood. Because of the blood. Come 
heaven. On the earth, when you speak from the earth, you're supposed to move heaven. Change your mind, change your mind, change your mind. Give up the religious way of praying. Give up the church way of praying. Pray as a son. Pray as a son. Pray from the position of your sonship. Pray from the position of righteousness. Move heaven. Move heaven. Move heaven. Expect an heavenly results. Heavenly response. Father, as we gather in this room in Mississauga, Ontario, there are many people even in this very city right now that doesn't even know that we're in this room. And even if they knew, they don't care. Because, Father, based on what the church has become today, the church has lost its relevancy. The world doesn't care about the church. The world doesn't listen to the church. And it doesn't care to listen because the church has lost its saltness. The church light has been put out for various reasons, Father. But, Father, as we come together in this room today, they don't need to know that we're here in order for us to be effective. They don't need to recognize us. As long as heaven recognizes us, that's what matters. And so, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, whatever it is that you want, whatever it is that you have willed, whatever it is that you have determined, whatever it is that you have, been, you have predetermined to manifest and to take place in this room, and that it will not only be in this room, but it will, there will be a ripple effect. It will go forth because, Father, we're dealing with principles. Principalities. We're dealing with powers. We're dealing with spiritual wickedness in high places. We're dealing, we're dealing, Father, with spirits. So, Father, today, we give you our lives. We give you our lives as a living sacrifice for you to use us to shift things in Mississauga. Shift things in Brampton. Shift things in the GTA. Shift things over Ontario, over the other provinces and the territories. And we're not here to have church, but we're here as the church to let your will be done as it has been already done in heaven. So, Father... We give you our lives for you to use it to affect the realm of the Spirit. Father, I, I, I recall when Philip, when Philip, the evangelist, went down to Samaria. Father, your word reveals to us that there was a man by the name of Simon the sorcerer. And Father, your word told us that he bewitched the entire city. There was a demonic control over the city. And Simon the sorcerer was the medium through which that spirit was operating. And the bewitchment was so intense that the people were seeing him as a god. They call him the great power of God. But Father, when Philip... When Philip went into Samaria and he began to preach the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Father, it, your word tells us that the witchcraft power was dismantled. So, Father, I believe that as I preach your kingdom in Mississauga, as I preach your kingdom in Mississauga, Something is shifting in the, in the atmosphere, in the hemisphere, in the stratosphere. And it's not only limited to Mississauga, but Father, it's spreading across Ontario. It's affecting the other provinces and territory. And Father, we're not feeling for anything. And we're not waiting to see something to believe that something is happening. The principle is already established. 
that when your word is preaching truth, something happens. Something happens. So, Father, thank you for what you're doing in this room. And it is spilling out. It is flowing out beyond this room. Let your kingdom come. Let your reign come. Let your rule come. And let your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Father, thank you. And Lord, I pray that those who come among us and they don't know you yet, that they will not think that they come to a social club. I pray that God, the Spirit of God, will bring conviction to them, Lord, that they will know that the living God is among us. And even if they see a certain level of hypocrisy among us, that, that Father, the truth of God is so strong that it overrides even the hypocrisy that they may see, that it convict them, that they leave and know without a shadow of a doubt that God is in this place. God is in this place. So be it, Father. So be it. So be it. So be it. So be it. Those of you that are standing, be seated if you can, please. These are passages that we need to meditate on. We need to meditate on them. The medium of prayer was never given to us from God to be a religious thing that we do. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. So the solution to the suffering is in the prayer. But if we're praying religious prayers, we're not going to have any solution. I never forget it. I never forget it. I'm trying to remember if you were the one who sent me that link some time ago. There was this thing that they had on CNN. There was this thing that they had on CNN. Um, something about 80s in America. You don't remember. But somebody had sent me the link. And when I watched it, they masked the face of the pastors that they were talking to. Every single person that was a part of that group they were pastors. And one of the most dangerous part of that documentary, that one of the pastor, one of the pastor that they were talking to, he was still pastoring. But he said he doesn't believe in God, he doesn't believe in the Bible. And what most of them said, why they leave the church and why they give up on God and why they give up on the Bible, they prayed, and God never answered them. They prayed, and God never answered them. They prayed, and God never answered them. Some of us are on the verge right now. You see, we still are coming to church, and we still are going. But our life is in a state, it's in a place where we're not hearing God. And we're praying and nothing is happening. And, and right now, 
We are ulting between opinions. You remember why Saul went to the witch? You remember why Saul went to the witch people? I don't joke with God's word. You remember why? The Bible said he was not hearing from God, neither by dream, neither by vision, nor by prophet. So now, when you're not hearing from God, you do not remain neutral. You seek for an alternative. The question is, the alternative that you're going to turn to, what will it do for you? What will it do? The man who was a pastor, and when the lady asked him, she said, but didn't you pray for people while you were pastoring? He said, oh yeah. But he said, I know that there wasn't any God, but because they wanted me to pray, I pray. So you know, nobody ever got healed. Because if you are praying, believing that there is no God, God is not going to answer your prayer. And I'm saying all of that to say this. It's because of the state of the church. Because of the state of the church. Because of the state of the church. And there's still so many people that are leaving the, what we call the church. And I, and I wouldn't say even the church, which is the body of Christ, really. It's the false church. The church that we have made, that we have made. People are leaving it. And not everybody leaving it is going into being an atheist. There's a lot of people who are leaving the church and they rather stay home. They have a strong desire for the things of God. And that's why even this channel, God himself, there are people that have come on that nobody shared it with them, nobody told them about it. God himself allowed it to pop up for them to hear truth because they desire it. This ministry is not here to be like any other ministry. And if we have to stand alone, doesn't matter the persecution. If we have to stand alone, and I hope I can talk for some of you. If we have to stand alone, I'd rather stand alone with the truth than to compromise. I'd rather stand alone with the truth than to compromise. Effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. I started um, teaching and truth. And the moment that was released, if you notice, some of you started to come under certain attack. If you notice, the attack did not happen until when that word started being released. Why? Now we get to the point where I release the word on faith last week. And throughout the past week, some of you 
your mind came under intense, intense attack. You shared something with me yesterday, what happened to you throughout the past week, and other persons, and even my brother, OJ, he, when he, when, when I met him at the door out there, and he said, Pastor, I went through some things this week. He said, my mind came under this attack. Why? Satan is not an idiot. Satan don't waste temptations. Anytime he comes at you, he's seeing something that you don't see yet, but you ought to see it. And when he comes at you, it's never where you are why he's attacking you. It's the next level that you're supposed to go. He doesn't want you to go there. Because he knows that if you go to that next level, it's going to be more difficult for him. <laughs> it's going to be more difficult for him to get you back. So he wants you to stuck. He wants you to stay stuck right here. But God Almighty sent me here today to let you know that you don't have to stay there. You, you can, you can, you can... Notice, notice, he came after Israel, not just because they were God's people here in the wilderness. And he keep messing with their mind and, watch this, get them to the point where they never enter the promised land. That God himself swore in his wrath that all of those who come out of Egypt, they will not enter into my rest. And remember... No, God is not wicked. God is not unfair. You remember how long he put up with them? How long, are you, how long would any of you put up with certain people? A week. Maybe two weeks stops. God put up with them for four, four zero, 40 years. God said 40 years long. You have seen my signs. You have seen the wonders, the miracles. And yet, you continue to tempt me. Notice, those who entered, it's those who realized, choose to recognize that God cannot lie. Joshua and Caleb says, when the ten spies came back and discouraged the people, the hearts of the people, the ten spies said to the people, the land is good. The grape, because they come back with clusters of grape on their shoulder. And while they're eating, they say, but we can't. We, we, we can't possess the land. Giants is in the land. And we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And they discouraged the hearts of the people. But two, Caleb and Joshua, Stood up and said, we are well able. We are what? We are well able to possess the land. Because if God is for us, they are bread for us. You see, it's not about your strength. It's not about your resources. If God is for us, that's the key. And Hela, you see, you see me, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm stating the truth right now. There's thousands of churches in Ontario. But you see, when this one come together, hell is more upset than anything else. Because hell knows of me not coming this poor. I am not coming here to stand in front of you and give you gimmickry. What do you think the devil will do when I do if he try to literally shut this ministry down? Literally wipe it out. Why do you think he might do that? And others have it to think that the other places where certain things not happening, they are the ones that are in the right. Something must wrong with this ministry. Something was wrong with Jesus, right? 
Pharisees constantly, you know, even seeking ways of destroying him. They plotting and they planning. Every single day, they even send spies among him. You've got to understand how the enemy works. When you know how he works, every single time that he shows up, you can dismantle his operation. Me say, I say, you can dismantle his operation every time he shows up. Jesus was not joking when he said to the disciples, Look, I saw Satan when he fell. I saw Satan when he fell. <laughs> Whew. Fell from heaven means that he lost his heavenly body, his heavenly position. So he came into the earth realm as a naked, unemployed, Angel, spirit, he's still spirit, but he has no legal position. So that's why you see, notice he goes around and he takes on a whole lot of positions. And the intent of taking on those positions is to bring frustration to the godly, legal, proper positions. And he can never, he can never get back his. Never. His, his sentence is already sealed. And when I think about that on a daily basis, that a, un, a naked, unemployed, disembodied being, because the moment he, he lost that, he does not have God's authority anymore. And he doesn't have access to it. But when I am in Christ, I have access to God as Father. I have access to God as it. Watch here. Jesus said, look, I saw him when he fell from heaven. And listen to me. I have given you power. I have given you authority. I have given you authority. To do what? To walk around and say, I have authority. No, he says, I've given you authority to tread. To tread. Stop complaining, tread. Stop crying, tread. I have given you authority to tread up and serpent. You don't need me to sit down with you for two and a half hours, three hours for you to tell me where you are going through. That's, that's not going to help anything. Tread. Tread upon serpents and scorpions. No, notice, notice the two, the two, what, what I call them creatures that Jesus used for you to understand something about demons. They are very dangerous. Do not underestimate them. Scorpion, serpent. And both of them, both of them are tricky in how they behave in nature. Because if you notice, these is not what bring harm to you where the scorpion is concerned. These are destruction. This is where the poison is. And these is what we're focusing on. The serpent, it's able to camouflage itself and stay hidden for a long time. And you don't know that it's there. And waiting for an opportunity to strike. 
But Jesus says it doesn't matter their ability. It doesn't matter what they're capable of doing. I have given you authority to dismantle them. You can take the serpent by the tail. You don't need to have a hook to hold down its head. You can take the serpent by the tail. That's authority. Moses, I want you to take the serpent by the tail. What? No, God, that's not the norm. The norm is that you hold down the serpent head because that's where the serpent is. That's where the serpent's power is. But God said, I'm going to show you that you have authority. Take it by its tail. Because watch this. If naturally, if you take it by its tail, whew, so you notice they always hold down the head. But God said, I'm going to show you my authority. Take it by the tail. We don't believe the Bible. We don't believe the Bible. You notice I never say you. I say we don't believe the Bible. And the time has come for us to stop that nonsense. If I didn't believe those scriptures, I would not be standing here today. If I stand here without believing those, I would be in compromise. And I don't even have time to think about and talk about what Satan is doing against me. My part is to do what God wants me to do. Because if you focus on what he's doing, again, that's like the scorpion. What, 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 what you call these? Is the pinchers of the, the, of the scorpion? That's the, the, that's the proper term? <laughs> huh? Ten, that's, would those be called tentacles? Claws. Satan keep getting away with things that he should not be getting away with. Now the reason why we're here, I, I believe the, the, the Holy Spirit just wants me to move on into that. I'm not going to stop to recognize any first-time visitors at this time. Not that we don't appreciate you coming, but I'm not going to stop to do that at this time. I'm just going to go straight into the Word. And wherever the Holy Spirit would have me to stop, I hope that you will continue to flow with the Spirit and receive from the Spirit. It's good to have you. And the most important thing is you're receiving from the Spirit. The divine principle of faith. The divine principle of faith. I want you to open your mouth if you can, if you may. If you will, and say it, please. Lord, I am the principle of my faith in God. I want you to say it again. The divine principle of faith in God. Say it again. The divine principle of faith in God. And what I want to accomplish or what God wants to accomplish through this teaching is to bring you to the place where you are, if I may use this term for lack of a better word at this moment, where you are comfortable in releasing your faith. God wants you to come to the place where faith becomes a natural, normal, easy thing for you to release. 
and see results from heaven. I'm not talking about the new age things that Creflo Dollar and Joel Osteen teaching. Those are mixed with Eastern philosophy. As I said to you last week, faith is not positive thinking. I hope I got your attention there. Faith has nothing to do with positive thinking. Positive thinking is a new age talk. God is not into new age. God is not into Eastern philosophy. God is not into yoga. God is God. He is the living God. He is eternal. And watch this. When God say something, it's not positive thinking and it's not positive talk. God is speaking out of who he is. And who he is. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be. And he kept on saying it, you know, because he has to build up positivity. And he has to, you know, build himself up, you know, because that's all they tell you, you know, you got to keep on thinking and you have to keep on talking positive. And every day, you know, you have a list of things that you say, I am, I am, I am, I am, you know, I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm going to make it and I'm going to get a six figure job and I'm going to have a house and I'm going to have a car. That's not, that's garbage. That is for orphans who don't know God. When God speak, God only speak once. Let me say that again. When God speak, you notice, you notice even Jesus, Jesus, you, you notice Jesus even healing the sick, doing whatever he's doing. He only speak once. When God said, let there be light, what happened? Do, do you believe the Bible? When God said, let there be light, what happened? What happened? I, I want you to get it enough. Um, Brother OJ sent me a text. I, I, I think it was Wednesday morning or Tuesday or something. I don't remember. Somewhere there. But the question he said, he says, when Joshua, he, he says, he says, if the earth revolves around the sun and Joshua command the sun to, stood, to, st watch this, to stand still, he said, I want you to explain to me what really happened. Here, listen, let me say it again. If the earth revolves around the sun and Joshua, do you believe the Bible? And Joshua, a man like you and I, a man like you and I, spoke to the sun and command. He didn't beg the sun. He command the sun to stand still. If the earth, let me say it again, if the earth revolve around the sun and Joshua command the sun to stand still, what really happened? Huh? Sister, Sister Charlene, Sister Charlene, I want you to say it and I want you to get it. I want you to see that. What, 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 stop, what, stop? It's not the sun because the sun never had a move. So the entire big old hurt, Sister Kim, sorry. The big whole hurt. Stop. For one whole day, the Bible says. The Bible said the first time such thing has never happened before. It's the first time in the history. Now, where, where, where I'm going with this, what would give Joshua such an idea? <laughs> Me say, where Joshua get that big idea that the I and I could look up at the sun, command the sun to stand still, and the sun obey him. 
he notice not, he spoke to the son. But the son knows, say, I am not the one that is moving. And I'm going to obey you. So if I'm going to obey you, there has to now be... <laughs> Hallelujah to God. Whatever is causing the sun to operate in its watches, in its, in its operation, the earth, the sun and the earth agreed. He didn't speak to the earth, he spoke to the sun. But the sun and the earth came into agreement. When Moses stretched out a piece of stick that was in his hand called the rod of God, a piece of dry stick, when he stretched it out across the sea and the sea parted and the water congealed on each side and the land where the sea has been for years soaking wet, immediately it became dry. And wherever there was any descent or any de whatever, everything became level immediately. You remember how it happened? It wasn't positive thinking. The Lord God said to Moses, what is that in your hand? Stretch it out. He did it. He did it in obedience to an instruction that came from the same God who said in the beginning, let there be light. And there was light. I said again, what gave Joshua the idea to command the sun to stand still? <laughs> hmm. And one of the things that God commanded him to do, he said, do not turn to the left or to the right. He says, have I not commanded you? He said, be strong. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong in who I am. Be strong in your faith. Be strong. And he says, he says, meditate, meditate. Joshua, you see the word that has been given to Moses? Meditate in it, day and night. So by meditating it, the word shift his thought processes. The word created certain things in him that it became a part of him so much. It became so natural that he knew that once I open my mouth and speak from that, there's going to be, there's going to be. The intent of this teaching, I'm going to say it again, from God, I didn't make it up, I didn't come up with it, it's not mine. The intent of this teaching from God for the church at such a time as this is to restore the church to its original intent, the original purpose for which the church has been placed in the earth by the Lord Jesus Christ and how the church is meant to operate. That you come to the place where these, this is not something that you second guess. It's not something that you think, you even think about. It's, it's just naturally flowing Whenever there is a need for it. How many of you inside here have a bank account? You have one? May I ask which of the bank you're with? I'm not going to ask you for the transit number and I'm not going to ask you for your account number. <laughs> you're with TD. And when you open the account, um, if you notice, do you know what a, 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 um, a, a passbook is for bank? Bank book? Yeah, these young people, 15, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, they don't know that. You remember, you remember when we first opened an account? There was a little bag, a little book. And every time you go to the bank, you have to bring it in. And when they enter and you make a deposit, the first, they used to use pen and write it in, and then after they had a machine that they put it in, and it prints out, and you go, and when it's full up, they give you a new one. But notice now, those books doesn't exist. You know that they still have it? They still do. <laughs> so if you want it, you can get it, but they don't give it to you anymore. 
What they give you now? You have a bank card? You don't have it? You have one? They give you a card. And it has... The power of this card is it lies right here. All your information, it's right there, right in that little thing there. So when you talk about Mark a beast, I'm afraid if, 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 if beast won't catch you, then catch you a long time. <laughs> because every time you use this, Wherever you use it, the time you use it, what you use it for, how much you use. That's why when you get your bank statement, you can go through the statement and go back and see where you, when, where you did this and this date and that. Ta even the time. But they give you this. What is this called? What is this generally called? That's a fancy name. Just a client card. Access card. So while TD gone to bed, the people that are running TD gone to bed, you can get, out, get up out, out of your house, drive to where they want to go, to a bank or wherever they have an ATM machine, and you can access your account anytime. Then they, they develop a app. And once you sign up the app, you have to enter the first thing that you have to, 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 to register, to register that account, you have to enter this. And then after that, you have the option of using a username. You can choose a username. But this is important for you to set up the, account, the, 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 set up the app. Now, you don't have to. If, it depends on what you're doing. You don't have to leave out of your bed. You don't have to leave from off your toilet. Have you ever done any banking on your toilet? Come on, be honest. <laughs> I've, I've <laughs> you, <laughs> Trisha, all you're saying is like you would never do it. <laughs> you, don't want the, you don't want them to know that you pay your bill on the toilet? <laughs> there are those moments when certain things, and, and like my wife will say, Hon, did you remember to pay that bill? I say, oh, no. And right there. <laughs> they receive and I know where you are sending from. They don't care. <laughs> Anybody see where I'm going with this? When you and I got born again. <sighs> God gave you an access card. Oh boy. You can use it anytime, anywhere. Not anyhow. Not anyhow, because there is a. <laughs> because even this, you can't just use it. As a matter of fact, they set limits to how much you can use daily, how much you can pull from the machine. And all of that, of course, is under the banner of security. How much you can use, how much you can shop in store. Because the amount that you can pull daily, you're given the freedom to use more in store, online. So there are principles that governs it. There are principles that governs it, right? So God gives us an access card, and the access card is known as fate. It's known as fate. This one is not from TD. 
This one is from H. Inc. Heaven Incorporated. <laughs> and, and there's a principle that governs it. Thank you, my dear. Anybody remember the four scriptures that I gave last week in starting this teaching? First one. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, the focus verse, 4. Second, Romans 1, 16 and 17, focus verse 17. Third one, Galatians chapter 3, 10 to 14, and the focus verse, 11. The fourth one. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 39. And the focus verse, verse 38. What all those four verses have in common? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. What they all have in common? Let me not write it. Let me go to where I have it. Because that's what I want to deal with. If I'm going to go down the road. I'll come back up the road with, within the next teaching. Because I showed you something last week that I want to go on. But then while I left, in between that, the Holy Spirit began to show me some things. And I realized that I could not just talk about that and just leave it because that's very important in order for us to come to the place of appreciating the rest of what's going to come. Because you have got to be able to put it together and lock it. So watch this. The just shall live by faith. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of, not the gospel about, but the gospel of Christ. There's a difference between of and about. So it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, it, the gospel of Christ, when it is preached, when it is announced, when it is released, whoever hear it, it is now, watch it, it now becomes the power of God. My God. It is released. Somebody hear it and believe it and it becomes power. And not just power, the power of God. To what? Salvation. Salvation. Where you're delivered completely from the kingdom of Satan. And now watch this. When you are delivered from the kingdom of Satan, God doesn't leave you in limbo. He takes you, if you're willing, and places you. He moves you. The word there, trans, translate translate it's the same greek word that is used when jesus said you will speak to this mountain and say move from here to there so god literally move you from the kingdom of darkness and place you into the kingdom of the son of his love that's salvation i said that's salvation but that salvation does not automatically happen. It happens when the gospel is preached. Have you ever heard persons say they got saved without a preacher? Yeah. 
if you get saved without a preacher, you're in a compromised position. Nobody gets saved. You, you, you say, oh, oh, when I got saved, I didn't get saved in a church. And I didn't get saved, you know, with no preacher or whatever. You're joking. You need to check your life. There was some time, somewhere down the road, a preacher released some words. And that word got inside of you. And it's like Kalalu seed. Kalalu seed in Jamaica. Kalalu seed. Do you see this place? It's a woodland. It, and, it's, and it's a forest. And then they cut it down and burn it. And then rain come. And all of a sudden you see this color. The seed has been there for years. Waiting for that environment to be conducive and then it grew. The word has to be preached in order for you to come into salvation. I said the word, were you looking at me funny? The prophet has to prophesy under the Old Testament in order for Israel to come into God's season. In order for God's Israel to come into the timing and the season of God. That's how God set it up. You know what I'm trying to help some of you to do? To stop waste your time listening to just any and anybody. You're supposed to listen to someone that is sent. You're supposed to listen to someone that is sent. I don't know if they catch him. But a couple of days ago in, 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 in Toronto... I think it was on the TTC, a gentleman showed up in police uniform. Of all the gears of a police officer, but he's not a police officer. So they put his picture on CP24 and other places looking for him. Why? Me say, I say, why are they looking for him? Is a what? Come on, say it, say it loud because they don't want chat because a lot of them are listening to imposters. Say it, sister. He's an imposter. I, I wish you could walk and slap them and tell them, imposter. Many of you said that you're born again and you continue to let imposters pour into you. No wonder you're all over the place. You're only supposed to listen to those whom God sent. And how do you know if they're sent? God said you're supposed to do what? Test every spirit. People believed, when that guy came on that bus, people believed that he was a police officer. That's dangerous. You imagine a person come to your door, and many of us don't understand that as a citizen, you have a right and if a police officer show up at your house and doesn't have a warrant, you don't have to let him in. So they have to ask you, can I? And if you say no, according to the law, they must walk away. And what you're supposed to do if a police officer come to your door, even when they have on the uniform, ask them to show you their ID, show badge, take number. And if you are still not comfortable, say, please, can you stay here for a minute? Let me call and confirm. Because they're supposed to have their last name. Confirm. There is a gentleman standing at my door. He said that he's so-and-so. I took his badge. I took this. And can, I want to confirm that this is so-and-so. Because based on the time you're living in, I saw this news clip from the United States where a guy impersonating a police officer, he got his car, his car set up just like a police car <laughs> and have been messing with people and there was a day when two undercover police officer on the road in an unmarked car him pull them over <laughs> the imposter pull over the real police officers and they oblige him 
and pull over and when he pulled them over if he had known that it was real police officer that he's doing he would not have done it when he pulled them over they knowing being a police officer the way how he even approached them they know that he wasn't guess what then come out of the car and arrest him <laughs> And when they did their investigation, they found out that he has been doing it for a long time. I want when demons show up around you. <laughs> I want when they show up around you. Come on, people. I'm not saying what I'm saying because I want you to listen to me. What have I been saying to you for nearly 14 years now? Ask God to show you who I am. Don't ask me for my bio. I can prop it up. And now with all AI, I can ask ChatGTP to do a bio on Ralph Somers. And he would do a lovely one. But when God show you who I am, there is no lie in it. I said, when God show you a person, there is no lie in it. There are times when God allow you to discern somebody and you even doubt what you're seeing. Until time roll over and you say, oh my God, what I really saw was so. When God show you a person, there is no lie in it. Stop doubting God. Now look at this. The just shall live by faith. What does it mean? What does it mean? The just shall live by faith. Some of us have run ahead and tell ourselves what it means. Is it true? What you think it means, is it true? So let's go back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 now. So I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in verse 16. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. The gospel must be preached. The gospel is not automatic in its effect. It has to be preached. That's the reason why God raise up preachers and send them. It has to be preached. Jesus even gives a clear, clear understanding of that in Matthew and in Mark. He said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Where? How is it going to be preached? How is it going to be preached? Who is going to preach it? Dogs? Of course God can use animals, but no, that's not his intent. When God uses an animal, you know that a prophet is in rebellion. Because God spoke to him from day one and said, don't go. He come back to God and said, God said, okay, go. Because God is not going back on what he said first. And God realized the heart of the prophet. That while he's on his way, God still want to stop him. He could not see the angel standing in the road with the sword. But the donkey saw the angel with the sword waiting to kill the prophet and the donkey saving the prophet's life and the donkey pulling back bruised the leg of the prophet the prophet start beat the donkey you know that he's not a canadian and he beat the donkey to the point that the donkey turned around and said my master all these years i have been serving you and i have never you thought the prophet would have gotten the warning Come on, come on, seriously. 
if you in your house, some of you have cat and dog, and one morning you wake up, and when you, when you wake up, the dog look and say, good morning, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> and the cat that is supposed to say, meow, the cat said, good morning, how was your sleep? <laughs> it has to be preached. It has to be announced. It has to be spoken. And there's a scripture that I'm going to go. And even though I'm quoting something from it now, I have to go there. Because there is so many things that has been taken from that passage. And it has been contaminated. And we need to hear the truth. Nothing but the, the absolute truth about it. But the scripture says this. Faith comes by reading. That's not what the scripture says. How you know that? You've read it? And you're sure that's what it says? No man. Faith comes by meditating. All right. You all agree with me. So you see, you see where you're in trouble now if you don't repent? Faith comes by what? And watch this now. How does the hearing come? By what? By the word of God. And how does the word of God come? By a preacher. Now, how does the preacher, how does the preacher get the authority and the ability to come and release the word of God to you? He's what? How can the preacher preach the word that is supposed to end result of the word is to produce faith? But notice where it all starts. God send the preacher. Because if God send the preacher, it means that the word that the preacher is going to release, it comes from the one who sends him. So why a lot of us are struggling in faith? We are not receiving the sent one. Some of you in this room today that came in, you're struggling with certain things. If you hear me today, you're not supposed to leave here the way you came in. Faith doesn't come by you reading the scriptures. That's not the... What, what are we talking about again? What is the main theme here? That is not the principle of you receiving faith. If that was the principle, by all means, read away. Right, watch this, reading has its place. But that's not how you come into the faith that God requires of you. People, please, I beg of you, even if you don't want to listen to me, make sure you find someone that God send. This is the principle that God put in place from Old Testament, from the time that man sinned. And when we look at how certain things start to play out in the scriptures, and God, especially when God brings the nation of Israel into existence, the Bible said God led them out by a prophet. And by a prophet, God sustained them. Did you know that Moses was a prophet? Did you know that Moses was a prophet? Okay. And notice... When the time of their deliverance came, God sent Moses to them. To do what? To announce it. So when the prophet announced the word, what does it do for you when you hear it and receive it? It gives you hope. And faith is the substance of things. So if you never hear, you cannot hope. talking about principle people we're talking about principle now watch this what does it mean the just shall live by faith 
In Romans chapter 1, 17, it says, For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed to the person who is hearing it. The righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. And notice, from faith to faith. What do you think that that statement means? From faith to faith. If you're looking at it naturally and looking at it from English grammar, because English sometimes, most times, it gets in the way of God. God can speak to you through English, but English is not what governs God's language. Neither French. God can speak to you through all the languages that is in the earth today, but none of the language in the earth governs God language. Father, you see them. You see them, right? You notice how them I look at me, Father? God can speak to you through all the languages that is present in the earth, but none of the languages in the earth governs God's language. Are you getting me? So the languages place limitation. Many times it enders us hearing God as we should. That's why God gives you what? His Spirit, so spirit to spirit. If you notice, those of you that hear the spirit, really, and you're really hearing the spirit, you notice many times when the spirit speaks, it's contrary to your mind. It, it literally mess you up. That's why many of you don't be away and say, because what he tells you, you're saying, no, sir, I don't believe that this is God speaking to me. Satan, I rebuke you. The blood of the blood of Jesus Christ is against you. Well, you know how much time we blood up the spirit? <laughs> if, you, if you look at a few examples in the scripture many of them but a few of them you, you remember um, naturally how many of us in this room how many of us in this room this room seating is a hundred and forty something or something like that. Say, round it off to 150. Now, the 150 of us in this room, you see uh, some big grown men, a lot of hair upon them back. So, you know, so those men eat a lot of food. So, you know, cooking all of Jamaica, you have to cook all, use one pound of flour to make one dumpling <laughs> and give them two dumplings and stuff like that because, so, you know, they're men. These are men that when you go to the restaurant and you go to all Jack Pan's Cake place, now you order the lumberjack breakfast. Come with five pancakes, four bacon, four, <laughs> four eggs, four ham, piece of ham. Four slices of bread, you choose your bread, rye, brown, white, and so forth. I ordered one time, I couldn't go, I couldn't even go halfway. <laughs> it's huge. So I'm saying this now. Naturally, if all of us in this room is hungry, naturally, naturally, what would we think to take care of the need of all of us in the room being hungry? We would think about it that if, say, we're going to even order something from Tim Martins, there would be a lot of stuff we'd have to order, right? If we're going to go over the food court and get something, we're not all going to go over there. We're going to send somebody over there to buy it. That's a lot of food they have to bring over here to feed a hundred and odd people. But notice Jesus is out in the wilderness, three days teaching, three days teaching. Teaching the word. Three days. That's what the Bible says. At the end of the three days, the disciples said, Lord, 
you need to send the people home now because, you know, whatever they have been here now for three days and so, Jesus said, give them something to eat before they go. Because if you send them away as they are, they will faint along the way. You remember what was one of the questions of the, one of the disciples? Lord, where are we going to find? <laughs> because we're in a wilderness. Number one, the place where you are, it's not conducive for you to do that. So where are we going to find enough food to feed all these people? And the Bible said that when Jesus said to them, give them something to eat, he was testing them for he himself knew what he would do. It's supposed to become natural for you. Andrew found a little boy, a little boy somewhere. He has his lunch bag. And I'm always wondering every time I read it, how come he out there for three days and not eat half the, 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 the fish and bread? How much did his parents give him? Now, for a little boy to give up his bag with his lunch, what would you have to say to that little boy to convince him to give up your lunch? Huh? Tell him that it's Jesus. It's Jesus. <laughs> it's Jesus. <laughs> but for whatever reason, he was willing to give it. And Andrew said, this is all we have here. And Jesus said, it's a... It's enough. You notice where we get trapped as people who say we're in God? We allow our eyes to dictate how we speak. We allow our ears to dictate how we speak. The disciples, when they saw that five loaves and few fish, it's the same thing that they were saying like many of us. It's not enough. But notice, when they brought it in the presence of Jesus, Jesus said... What does faith say? What does faith say? What does logic say? What does reason say? It's not enough. So some of you, your bank account. <laughs> your bank account has been in a... Very, <laughs> and guess what? We keep on speaking according to what the bank account is telling us. So therefore, we remain trapped in the cycle of what we're saying. It's not enough. It's not enough. The bill come, I don't have enough. This needs to be done. I don't have enough. Because you're looking at your bank account as your source. You're looking at your paycheck as your source. You're looking at the means of whatever you are employed in or whatever you employ to bring money to you. You keep looking at that outlet and when it's not producing what you want, you say you don't know how. Notice why you open your mouth and say, I don't know how I am going to manage because... And you have the audacity to think that it's Satan. Satan has very little to do with a lot of stuff. That is, it's your mouth starting with your, starting with your mind. The way you think affects the way you speak. The way you speak affects your actions. You have to think it first before you speak it. And you have to speak before you act. So where do you think Satan attack you? You think he's here that he attacks you? You think he's here that he attacks you? No! He attacks you here because he knows that out of this flows the issues of life. 
And he speaks to your mind through various ways. So every time you check your account, mm, so there are certain things that you don't even think that you can do it because your account is speaking so loud. <laughs> I know I'm reading a lot of letters inside here today. Right? You brought it out in the public. <laughs> and there are those of us that even where our job is concerned, when you get your salary at the end of, whether it's a fortnight or end of the month, it is never enough to deal with the need that is around you. But what does faith say? I'm coming back to that. I'm coming back to that. But I want you to look at something quickly with me. Go to 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings. And I want you to go to the fourth division. Chapter 4. And I want you to go to subsection. Forty two. Verse forty two. Then a man came from Baal, Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. Because this was a principle in the Old Testament. The, the, the concept of first fruit is also spoke about in the New Testament. When they have a first fruit gift, a first fruit offering, they would bring it to the prophet. They would give it. Because they know in giving it to the prophet, the principle is that once you give it to the prophet, receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet. You're giving it to God. You're honoring God. So notice, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. The first fruits. So he's obeying the principles that is given to him. And notice, the first fruits made 20 loaves of barley bread and 20 newly, and not 20, but 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripe grain in its knapsack. And he said, the man of God says, give it to the people that they may eat it. But notice, he brought it and gave it to the man of God first. And the man of God in turn says, give it to the people that they may eat. Verse 43. But his servant said to him. <laughs> his servant said to him. Like, you know, your bank book and your paycheck and your, the situation around you. I talk to you. His servant said to him. What? Notice, notice, notice. What? <laughs> My wife don't like this. You know, she talk and I said, what? She said. It's you, Emmanuel, get it from. She says that I should say pardon. But <laughs> that, that I, I'm still working on pardon. I'm say, when I said, what? She called me and she said something. And I said, what? She said, don't say what? Pardon. <laughs> but the servant said, when, when the man of God said, give it to the men. Give it to the people that they, the servant said, What? Shall I set this before 100 men? So now, the miracle that Jesus performed, it wasn't the first time in Scripture. Watch this. And he, the man of God, said again. He said again, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and and have what? <laughs> they're going to be eaten. Watch this. They're going to eat. Their belly is going to be filled and going to have leftover. 
when God do, when God move, when, when God show up, there's always a spillover. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. Verse 44, so he, the servant, set it before them. Just like how Jesus give it to the disciple and tell the disciple to give it to the people. The servant set it before them and they ate. Now, now let's see if, 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 if what he was saying was true. And they ate. Because 20 barley loaves, you know. The barley loaves, you, you know, um... You know, the, um, I think they, they, they call it dinner bread. You, you know, dinner bread, it, dinner rolls, dinner roll. They, they're tiny. You can take all five of them, squeeze the pushing on your mouth, big man. <laughs> so the barley loaves are, are small, tiny little loaves. So that's why when the prophet says, set it before them, he said, what? That, that, this, is, this is just for one of them. He said, God says, they're going to eat. And they're going to have left over. And so verse 44. So he set it before them. And they ate. And some left over. Why? According. 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 Hallelujah. Somebody said beat unto me. According to your word. From faith to faith, if you look at it in the English and look at how it is written, it will seem about, you know, like there is a progression. There is, you know, some people say it's growth and stuff like that. That might be a part of it. And when we stuck with that, we're in assumption. What it really means is this. It's about, watch this. It's about continuation and sustainability. Look at it. The just shall live. So it's what's going to sustain you when you are the just. So now, what I want to ask question that I want to ask at this point, how do you become the just? Because the, the word just, should I use another? The word just, should I do this or do this? It's also this word. The righteous, the just, the righteous. How do you become righteous in God? That's why we are struggling. We are struggling because we are doing what we think to make us righteous. <laughs> And that's why Satan get away with telling you certain things. And, we, and there are those of us that we, we find ourselves constantly under this cloud of guilt. And guilt and condemnation. Because we try to do this, but we didn't do it as we think we should. And therefore we feel guilty. And Satan come and he say, mm -hmm. okay. God is not going to hear because you didn't do this. God is not going to hear because you have not been spending enough time reading your Bible. And look at the truth. You are working, and some of you are doing two jobs. Two jobs. I do, I'm still going to say it. I do not believe that a child of God should be doing two jobs. You work one job in the day and then, and then, and, and, and especially, I do not believe that a child of God should be killing up themselves, right? Doing all of those things. For what reason? Why, why would you be doing two jobs? Tell me. Tell me. Come on. Speak the truth. Speak the truth as somebody say and kill the devil. Why, why would you do two jobs? 
<laughs> huh? Why? It's for the money. And why do you want that money? Because of the needs. Now, in your estimation, if I don't do this, how am I going to manage? manage. See, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's it. Manage. Manage. Who's supposed to be managing your life? You are God. Because when you take over the management, it comes with a lot of stress. It comes with a lot of heartache. It comes with a lot of pain. It comes with a lot of, a lot of worry, a lot of struggle. Because guess what? You can't do it. Jeremiah said, it is not within man to direct his own self. You don't know where to put your next foot. So you're always... <laughs> you're always gambling and hoping that, you know... But when the Lord directs your steps, Psalm 37, the steps of a... The steps of a righteous man, they are ordered by God. And notice Psalm 23, he leads me, when God is your manager, he leads me in the parts of, for whose sake? So when he becomes my manager, he's my shepherd, he's responsible to lead me into green he is responsible to lead me to the water, still water. And when I am going through certain things, he restores my soul. He's the one. And when I need certain care, he anoints my head. The shepherd does that for one, for one. For many, there, there are several reasons, but the main thing is that to keep flies from laying their eggs, they go even in the ear of the sheep and in the head. And then when the egg is now laid in there and it breeds the worm, it can kill the sheep. So they anoint the sheep head with oil to keep the flies away. So God anoint you to keep demons from whispering and give thoughts of suggestion. So you lift up the shield of faith and you block the fiery dart. <laughs> Satan says, you, you talking about you, son of God, which part are you? You talking about you, son of God, look what you did. Look what you did last week. Look what you did yesterday. You, look what you did last night. Which part are you? You ain't no son of God. You say, yes, that's true. <laughs> I'm a worm. So you come in here, and some of you are not afraid to pray it out loud. Lord, I am so unworthy. And Lord, we are dirt, and we are worth. Don't you come around with that dirt prayer? <laughs> we read things in the Old Testament that we take now and are used to our life when we're in Christ. And in the New Old Testament, the psalmist said, I'm a worm. So now you are a worm. If you're a worm, then your father is a worm. Because worm begot worm. They come and say, I'm a dog. You're calling God a dog? The just, the just, Watch this. Continuation and sustainability. So once you come into the position of being a righteous person, you continue. One of the problems that many persons have with me, it's the confidence that I have. The way I talk. Preachers are afraid of me. And they say that I am cocky. When you believe that you are righteous, 
you must think it, speak it, and act like it. Every, every time. Because, watch this, if the just is living by faith, they do not, watch this, they do not think that they're righteous today and then tomorrow. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure about that because, you know, certain things that happen. You know, I read my Bible, I pray. I went to my bed. I have a dream. I'm having sex with a guy. Eh? How could I be righteous? Satan is messing. It's a lie. You didn't have no sex with no guy, did you? Do it feel so real? You know, just when you wake up and you feel yourself and realize that so you're in the room at 154, 97 something road, apartment 42, you realize you say, Thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Satan mess with you even in your dreams because he wants you to doubt that you you could ever be righteous you notice that some of us have been born for a number of years now and even up until now when you go to pray you're still telling God about the sins that you committed when you were in sin before you got born again? Yes, you notice? You notice ever so often you find yourself a repent of those sins from 1951 and 1962? Huh? And you think that because you're doing that, God is now going to be pleased with you. No, 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 no. It's the opposite. Because God made you righteous, not based on your merit. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any of you should boast. So when you, watch this, let me not just talk. Let me not just talk. I need to show you something. I need to show you something. How much time do I have? How much time do I have? <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Look at Romans chapter 3. I know I need to stop soon anyway. Romans chapter 3 verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now, but now, say now. now. What, what, what does the word now connotes? It's, this is, in, 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 in English, this is present tense, right? Right? Present tense. But now... The righteousness of God, apart from the law, the law is based on works, doing. In order for a person to be righteous where the law is concerned, you had to keep all the law perfectly. If you break one, you are guilty of all. So notice now what the scripture is saying. The righteousness of God apart from doing the law is revealed. Being witness. Watch this. The law was a witness to that righteousness. And the prophets was a witness to that righteousness. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God even the righteousness of God, even the righteousness of God, through what? The just shall live by what? So the righteousness that you now come into to make you the just, how did you get it? How did you get it? <laughs> so why is it that after you receive it by faith, you go back to works? 
thinking that it's the amount of scripture that, come on, if, if, if you have the time to read the whole Bible in one day, by all means. And especially if you're single. But not if you're a father like me and a husband like me. Because I need to give attention to my wife because she's not a piece of furniture. There are times when she needs to be touched. <laughs> there are some wives even furniture is better than them because every so, every so often the furniture get dust some wife a long time your husband not touch you me mean touch you never walk close enough sometime you know my wife all at me up and she say you <laughs> she said look look for a big space <laughs> <laughs> so I on purpose walk close and rub up on her. <laughs> so you can do that if you, if, you, if, you, if you have the time. But what if you don't have the time? So notice where some of us have this cloud of guilt. We have a job. And the job is from X time to X time. You work from Monday to Friday or from Monday to Saturday. Then Sunday is the only time that you have. Some of us, we may get a day off in between. There are certain things that we have to do. When you have a job and you're doing certain things, you don't have the time to sit down and read the Bible for two hours. Do you think that God is holding that against you? When I just got... I'm born again, and about uh, a few months, maybe six months or so into it, I got this job. And then before I got the job, I could attend every single meeting that they had. And the denomination that I was a part of, guess what? The only time they don't have meeting is on a Saturday. And Saturday night, because Saturday morning we clean the church and prepare it for Sunday. So Sunday morning, 5 o'clock prayer meeting, 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock divine worship starts. And go up until about 2 or 2.30. And then you go home and you come back for 6.30 for prayer meeting. And 7 o'clock Sunday evening meeting starts. And we have testimony service. <laughs> and you have to go to work Monday morning. And if you don't come to one of the service, it becomes a sermon. And I've seen marriages mash up because you need to spend time. If, listen to me. If you know one, two, watch it. Listen to me. When you come to marriage, once you're married, the Bible even tells you, say, the married man care for the things of the world that he may please his wife, and the wife care for the things of the world that he may please his husband. So it's not a sin for you as a wife to go a Victoria's Secret and come home with some secret. <laughs> you married, but if you're single, we all go a Victoria's Secret for... <laughs> and even if you do go Victoria's Secret as a single person you keep the secret to yourself <laughs> and I remember one night when I was living with these people every morning we have prayer we have prayer in the afternoon and then we have prayer in the evening before we go to our bed. So one night we sit down as we normally would and we read a two chapters so on and then we're praying. And in the midst of the prayer, I heard myself saying, Lord, you see that my hand is broken? And then, and then I jump up and say, but wait. My mind was tired, Sister Kim. I'm coming from work, work all day. And the work that I was doing was hard work, rough, heavy. So my body was tired. And I found out at that moment that if I was tired, that your mind could not even focus properly. And you keep repeating the prayer over and over. When you reach the point, because we always end the prayer with the Our Father prayer. And say, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be thy name. And then you reach one point. 
And then you know, remember, if you did say, Allah be thy name, so you start over. <laughs> and I found out, it took me a long time to realize that if I was tired, I could go to my bed, sleep, and whatever time I wake up, I talk to God, and there was no sin. Because it's not based on my works. It's based on me believing the just shall live by works, by faith. It says, the righteousness, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To who? To all and and all who do what believe. believe it for there is no difference that's why verse 23 comes in people just pick out verse 23 without understanding the context so verse 23 says, for all why is it why is it to all and on all who believe for there is no difference where jews and gentiles is concerned for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god being justified how did God justify you? Freely. How did God make you righteous? Freely. Freely. Come up here. You come up here too. I want you to turn your face to them. I'll use Brother Patrick too. And I'll, I'll use Leah. Come here. So. Ten. Twenty. When last somebody give you twenty dollars? <laughs> Insane thinking wife gave money recently. <laughs> and 50. When last somebody gave you $10? You don't remember? Mm, wow. And for you, Liz, I'm going to give you something else. I'm not going to give you money. I'm going to give you pen I, I, I actually collect pens so for me to be giving away my pen whew, oh that's a sacrifice <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's beautiful it has certain weight to it and the, and the way how it writes it's just beautiful nice and smooth silk inside that, yes. Now, did you ask me to bring you something this morning? Any of you? You would tell the truth, right? Did you know that I was going to do this? Mm -hmm. So, you didn't work for it, right? I'm not paying you. You didn't do anything for me. Now, you received this, right? Sure, you can do something with that $50. You can do something with that pen. Can do something with that $20. Can that $10 do something for you? Mm -hmm. Stay there. Stay there for a little. You were born. You're born in sin. You're all out there doing your thing. You don't even know God, care about God. And the moment came that God Reveal himself to you through his word. And he brings you in. And everything that is happening, he's giving it to you freely. You're not telling him what to do. You're not telling him how to do it. He's just doing it because he pre, he predestined you. So all you have to do is what? The just 
shall live by faith. And, 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 and while you're in Christ, to the very end, everything. Notice James chapter 1. Every good and every perfect gift, notice gift, comes from above, from the Father of light with whom we have to do, and there is no shadow of turning in him. It's a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. When God sends someone, when God sent a prophet, when God sent an apostle, they themselves is a gift to you. God, God will give you a wife. God will give you a husband. God give you children. Children are an heritage of the Lord. God will give you a house. God will give you a car. But why, why many of us have never testified of something like that? Because we are not open to it. We don't believe that is possible and we are not open to such. Because we don't believe that such thing can even happen. God gave us the free gift. Stay there. It says... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not the end of the verse. That's not the end of the chapter. Verse 24 says, being justified, what? Freely. By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as a? propitiation which means a substitute for you that where you should have died Christ take that place right now a perpetuation by his blood through through to demonstrate what his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over God has passed over you don't even have to confess your sin when you confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Foolishness, church, I tell you about you need to pray the sinner's prayer and you need to confess your sin. That's not biblical. God pass over the sin. The moment you come to Christ, God pass over your sin. He doesn't require that you confess him, pass over it. So why are you confessing 1962 sin? God pass over it. That's, a, that's what the Bible said, right? He pass over it. You remember, in, you remember in Egypt? You remember in Egypt? When he was going to bring them out, the last plague. You remember what he told them to do? Kill the lamb. Put the blood where? Over the doorpost. On the side of the door. And he said, he said, when I see the blood. When I see the blood. So when he see the blood of Jesus. When you believe that Jesus died for your sin. When you believe that Jesus paid the price. When you believe that Jesus became the perpetuation for your sin. He passed over. He passed over it. And give you righteousness. <laughs> God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So you no need for bringing up. You no need for confess it. By the way, when they tell you that you need to confess your sin and give your heart to Jesus, and when Jesus comes, you know, you're going to go to heaven. Did you really confess all your sins? You get saved when you're 40. <laughs> you get saved when you're 40, or some of us even get, old, get saved when we're older. How many sins did you commit in that 40 years? Do you remember even some of them? So how are you going to confess them? Thank God he passed over it. Because if he require me to confess it all, I will not even remember some of them. Sometimes it's way along the path. Certain things come back and say, oh my God, I can't believe that I was a part of that. Sometimes certain things come up and then you recall, wow, I used to be a part of that. 
God does not. It's a lie. Preachers are telling God's people. Where the sinner is concerned, being saved, being born again, God does not require the sinner to confess their sins. You know who God required to confess your sins? After you're born again. John chapter, first John chapter 1 and verse 9. If you are willing to confess your sins, because after you're born again, the moment you sin, the Holy Spirit convicts you of it, so you can repent of it. And he says, if you are faithful to confess it, I am faithful and just. I am faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of it. I'm, 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 I soon stop. I'm going to stop somewhere. But listen this now. Listen this. I need to read verse 25 again. Whom God set forth. Whom? Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. God set forth as a perpetuation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously, previously sister committed. So if you, if you, if you, if you, if you had an abortion or even 50, he passed over it. You don't need to live under that guilt and that condemnation. Oh my God. If you were a a sex worker, if you were a witch, if you stole a woman husband, if you stole a man wife, if you murdered somebody and buried them in the backyard and plant the maple tree on the grave and sell the house and move to King City, you, I'm, 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 getting, I'm being real with you. God forgives you. You remember say Moses kill Moses murder one Egyptian and bury him in the sun. Wasn't he the one that God used to deliver Israel out of Baal? Did you know that the greatest of the apostles is Paul? Remember when he was Saul? He murdered people. Saul, he even said it. He said, I am the least of the apostles, but by his grace, I am what I am. He said, I murdered. I put people in prison. I did all of these things. But he knew that he had received the free gift of righteousness. So he said, he said, I am free before all of you and before God. He said, my conscience bearing me witness. But no, you are a murderer. No, that was the old. You notice his name even changed from Saul to Paul. Some of us cannot believe that God can forgive us. Look at the example. I gave her $50. I gave her a pen. Special pen, special pen. <laughs> and I'm not going to take it back. And I'm not going to think about it after I leave here today. I'm serious. I give it to you. Hmm? I give it to you. It says, it says, it says, after I pass over the previous sins that was committed, he said, why did he do that? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, watch this, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith. The just shall live by faith. So whatever you believe in Jesus, you continue to believe that to the end. God did that, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith. And verse 27 says, where is boasting then? All right. All right. If, if God did it all, where is boasting then? He said, it is excluded. Watch this now. Watch this, people. Watch this. It is excluded by what principle? By what principle? By what law? The word lawyer, principle. By what principle? Of works? No. No. The Bible said, no, 
you were going to say works. And the Bible said, no. <laughs> Watch this. But by the principle of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified, a man is made righteous. The word justified, to make it, would I say, simple? Justified, when God justify you, is just as if you had never sinned in all your life. Open your mouth and say, I am justified. I am justified. God justified me. God justified me. There, there, there's, a, there's a thing in law. I think maybe we might have some people in here that know about law. But there's a thing in law where you commit a crime. You are perfectly guilty. But you go to the court, and they have something that is called the mercy of the court. Right? And when the thing, and especially most time it happens to individuals if you are a first time offender. If you are a repeated offender, the key needs to get lost <laughs> after a while. But you lean on the mercy of the court, and what they do, they acquit you. And when you're acquitted of the crime, there's another procedure that, they, that further takes place, that they expunge the record. Because if they did not do that, when you go to the border, And the custom officer said, what is your purpose of visit today? Say so and so and so and they take your passport and they, and they start to click, 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 click. If they don't expunge that, they share information. Mm -hmm. That's something that happened a few years back. So they share information. So they, once it starts to whatever, your record would pop up. And all of a sudden you see two officers come and they bring you in our room. <laughs> but when they expunge it they remove it that it's no longer nobody can find it you and I we were guilty of sin <laughs> we were destined to doom and wrath but we came to faith in Jesus Christ and when you came to him, God the Father, notice, it's not Jesus is the justifier. It's the Father. But the Son is the one through whom the Father extend that to you. So you have to believe on the Son. Did you, have you ever heard the story, true story, of this man who had one son, only child? And the son joined the army and went in the army, was in the army for a while, and he ended up dying. And what the son, the son did drawings and stuff like that. And ever so often, he would send something to the father, send letter and send something for the father to know, you know, I'm here and so on, so on, so on. And after the son died, the father was well off. He had stuff. And before he died, he put it in the will that this is what he wanted done with his estate. The son, the son had sent him a drawing, and he had it framed. And in the will, he said that this is what he wants done now. So they're going to auction of the estate, but this is the condition. It's whoever buys that drawing would get the entire estate. Start the auction, have it there. Nobody wanted it because it doesn't look too good, but it's his son who draw it, and he cherish it. And it goes on and it goes on. And they're waiting. And say, we're wait, we're, we're, what else is coming? What else is coming? The man there keep on saying, you know, 
who, who want to do the first bid? That are, nobody, everybody, because they don't want that. They're waiting now for, you know, something else big to come out, man, and something fancy. And after a long while, somebody made a bid. And when they made the bid, the man say, anybody else? You know, you know they do it, going once, going twice. And he said, oh, sold to this person. And he said, it's over. They said, what are you talking about? He said, these are the conditions of Mr. So-and-so. He says, whoever buys that gets the entire estate. God says, whoever receives my son gets that's why the son even says to us i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to who but by me so whoever gets the son gets it all and i i stop i stop he says he says he says therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is it he the God, or is he the God of the Jews only? No. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised, the circumcised, which is the Jews, by faith, so even for them to come into the salvation and righteousness now, they must also believe. Not because they were Jews and Abraham's children, they have a right. No, they also have to receive it by faith. And the circ uncircumcised through faith. Verse 31 says... Do we then make void the law? Now you need to understand this, what this means, because persons are confusing themselves to think that after I come to faith through grace to Christ, I need to keep the law. What is he saying? Because this is not the end of the writing, because you need to continue to chapter 4 and realize that this is not what you thought he's saying. Do we then make void the law? What was the argument coming down? There is a righteousness that is required by the law. But the way in which you come into that righteousness is by doing the deeds of the law, the works of the law. And again, if you fail in one, you fail in all. So the righteousness of the law is still, watch this, it's, it's the righteousness that you and I come into in Christ, but without the works of the law. So by faith in what Christ has done on the cross, God make you righteous. The same righteousness that the law requires. God now, in, in, in the reading, as you go through Romans, there's a word that is used, imputed. You know what it means? To a credit. A tribute. In part. So you didn't do anything, and God put it on your account. And if he put it on your account, why wouldn't you receive it? You, you want to give it back to him because I don't deserve it? I'm going to let you sit down in a minute. Do we then make void the law? Through faith? He says, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish it. So by faith, the righteousness that is required of the law by works, you now believe in the Son of God and God accredit it to your account. Accredit it to your account without the works because you believe. Because in chapter 4, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father had found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, so you see now, you can't say it's that because people are reading and stop right there so and say, oh, I still need to keep the law. He says, no, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has, not, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham did what? And God accredited 
to his account. God bless you. I want you, I want you today, as you hold on to that $50, I want you to see what God did. You didn't do anything for that. And nobody now just get up and give $50 today. Especially today, in a time like now, where grocery price going up, gas price going up. Who you think is just going to walk up unless God twists their hand? <laughs> And I give it to you. No strings attached. I give you my pen. <laughs> no strings attached. I give you $20. $20. Big things, $20. $20 can do something. You can get lunch. You can get... <laughs> Bless you. $10. Ten dollars. Hmm? Coffee. Lunch can get stuff with ten dollars. Yeah. No strings attached. And you hold on to that, knowing that it's what watches. It's yours. You don't need to go and tell anybody that I gave it to you. You own it. So somebody says, that's my $50. That's my $10. That's, that's my pen. You own it. The just shall live by faith. Once you're made righteous, you own it. You own it. And you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am what? I am. Say this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for my sins. He paid the price with his life, which is his blood. I am a Son of God because I choose to believe what Jesus Christ did for me when he died on the cross. I now have a right because of the blood to claim sonship, claim righteousness. I am, I am, I am. I am, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, I am. So what do you do when your mind comes under attack? And there are thoughts and suggestions that is bombarding your mind and telling you, and there's this spirit of worthlessness that shows up and you feel unworthy. What do you do? One of the main things that faith does, it speaks. So when you feel like you are not, what do you say? And there are those moments when certain things happen. And one of the things that is said, I am going to touch on that as I go on with the teaching also. But not today, of course. In Hebrews chapter 6, you remember when we had our last baptism? What, that was one of the passages that I read from in talking about what... what uh, what requires, what, what qualifies you for water baptism. Hebrews chapter 6 and the first three verse, it gives us some elementary principles for us to understand that these things starts out our faith. It's the foundation of our faith. And it says, 
that we repent from dead works. We repent from dead works. Watch this. Faith towards God. The dead works have to do with your past. So ever so often, remember what Jesus says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, the spirit wanders all over and then it comes back to check, to see if the house is empty. And when you stop confessing who you are in Christ, your house starts to get empty. And when you come and check to see if the house is empty and you are not doing your part in terms of your confession, Jesus said that spirit is going to go and it's going to get some spirits that is more wicked than itself and come back and occupy that house. And Satan always comes at your mind first. He comes at your mind first. And you start to think it. And then you believe it to the point where you start to speak it and it affects how you start to behave. How do you counteract it? By saying what God says. What did God say about you? He justified you. He gave you righteousness freely. And he made you a son. So when the devil come and say, you're that and you're this and this and this and this is what happened and this is where you're coming from. And some things from your past begin to stir up. You open your mouth and you pull it down. You declare, don't wait on feelings. You open your mouth and you pull it down and state who you are. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Psalm 90. Psalm 91. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. What the redeem of the Lord is going to say. The Lord is my refuge and my strength. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from this night some pestilence. The sun shall not smite me by day nor the moon by night. The redeem of the Lord say so. Redeem of the Lord say so. I love you. I bless you. I said I love you. And I bless you. You are the just. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I do not care what you did, how you did it, when you did it. Where you did it, how you did it, I don't care. Because God doesn't care. Because once you come to the Son, He pass over the previous sins that you had committed. And the people of God needs to hear these truths. Because we come under certain attack. For some of you sometimes weekly. In spite of you coming and you get the teaching, you go and the devil just bombarding your mind. And you, 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 it's like you, you, you're struggling to come up to catch your breath. <sighs> the devil is a liar. You are not your past and your past is not you. If God pass over it, you're supposed to pass over it too. I said, if God pass over it, you're supposed to pass over it. So the enemy, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. <laughs> if I need more, you have more? So why you take out the Bible? Oh. <laughs> I'm looking for heavy burden. Oh. Oh. Yes. Your Bible looks like it weighs about five pounds. 
come here, my dear, Liz. So before you come to Christ, you know, you have all these, put that over your shoulder. Uh, where did I get this? Oh, it's your. <laughs> it's Trisha Buck. It's lunch. And you are on Matthew chapter 11. 28 to 30, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that are labored and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And when you come to him, he take it. Jesus paid it all, all to him I hold. Sin, crimson, he washed. So notice, notice. When Jesus, when you come to you, every burden, every, every, every one of these filled with something of your past, of your life. And Jesus take it all. And now you're on the road and you're on your path. And you're now the just. You're free. Yes. Lift your hands. Yes. And when Jesus take it, he gives it to the Father. And the Father says that he will remember your sins no more. I am free. Praise the Lord. No longer bound. No more. This one was here. <laughs> it's demonstration purposes. I shouldn't be giving it back to you, but it's demonstration purposes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not giving you back your sins. <laughs> Is a real pat in there? Oh, it's a container. <laughs> This is yours. I'm right. We need to see what that looks like when we sing it again. Bless you. Stand with me, please. Come here. Um, Chrissy? Chrissy. I met this young lady yesterday in our fasting meeting. She, um, you, you live in Ottawa. And, um, Shay? I think the connection was made through. And it was yesterday I realized that Prosper was also through that connection. And Shay said there is this platform that Christians and whatever, and he was talking to them and realized that they were living in Canada. And now Prosper is here. Um, Prosper, you're going to be the next baptism, right? So he's here, and then I met her yesterday, and um, she was telling me how the connection. So you came down from Ottawa for what business? So you actually come to be a part of the meeting yesterday and today, because you told me you're going back tomorrow. Wow. The... 
the Lord is doing some things that I, I can't even, I, I can't explain it. I cannot explain it, but you know what I'm, 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 I'm simply doing? I'm just following him. I'm just going with the flow. Listen, you have been redeemed. You have been justified. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you're a son of God, and that is your primary purpose. And I know you coming here yesterday and today, God has already deposited something in you. It was already established even before you walk in the room. And you're leaving not as you came. Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for what you're doing in this room right now and what you continue to do. And as the word has been preached, the word has been released, there is a deposit, 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 there is a deposit. Ah, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the shift. I thank you for the shift that is taking place in our life. I thank you for the shift that is taking place in our mind. I thank you for the shift that is taking place in our spirit. I thank you for the shift that is taking place in our speech. I thank you for the shift that is taking place in our action and in our life. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That there are chains that have been removed. That she didn't have to do anything about it, Father. All because she came to faith in your son. Cycles that have been broken that was not established by you. And Father, I thank you that you're making all things new. You're not making new things. You're making all things new. You're giving her the direction that she needs. You're giving her, Father, you're giving her the direction that she needs. You know the desires of her heart. You know the desires of her heart. Thank you, Lord, for fulfilling the desires of her heart. And you will complete that which you have begun. You will complete that which you have begun. You will complete that which you have begun. You you have begun. Father, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. There is a, a um. message that her sister shared with me yesterday. Listen to this. This person was visiting with her. And she was thinking that, you know, I have these visitors. So she wasn't even planning on coming to the meeting the Sunday. But she said she was there and she just felt the need to come and decide. Did she even end up reaching late? And she came with them. So they didn't catch most of the meetings, but she came, she introduced the persons to me, and they left, and they went back to their different places. And one of the persons continued to watch and listen. And the person said this, I'm not gonna call any name now or stuff like that. Said, reach out yesterday to the person, I said, I just want to thank you again for introducing me to your church, right? I am so glad God directed me to your house. So they came to visit that particular weekend. I'm so glad that God directed me to come to your house that weekend for me to get to connect to him again. God directed her to her house for her to be connected to him again. Notice how God worked. You going to church, even though we were really late, you watching it on your phone. So the sister said she had the meeting streaming on the phone in the vehicle, not knowing that they were paying attention to it. So they were listening. You were playing the vehicle, the, the, watching it on your phone. And I got to hear what your pastor was preaching. I felt the connection instantly. Even though I don't attend in person, I have never missed an online meeting from that time. 
I tell you what different it has made in my life. A whole new world has opened up for me. I can fully see that the light, watch this, I can fully see the light. The anxiety is gone. My blood pressure is normal. I feel lighter and a lot of things has that, that and people that would that would bother me, it's all gone. <laughs> it's all gone. It's all gone. And I'm saying to you today that when we really understand who God is and how God operates, every single burden that you came in this room with, just as though I used the demonstration with my sister, you don't have to come out here with it. You don't have to go back through the doors with it. You can leave it. Sister Donna, um, Sister Denise, there's a lady beside you. You know her? I want you to come down here with her. Every single baggage that you came in here with today, that you should not have even came in with, but somehow you came in here with it, I want you to check it in before you leave. How are you? Good, how are you? I am doing great. Good to see you again. All right? Stand here. Stand, stand, stand beside her. I'm going to pray with you. All right? Where's my wife? Where's my wife? Come here. My dear sister Denise, bless you. Let me give you a hug from now. Um, she, she had um, terrible, I mean, when I say terrible panic attacks before we got married. And um, I remember the last time she came under that attack, I think if I'm not mistaken, was we were having a Bible study meeting and there was something that happened. And when, she, when it happens, it's like she's going to die. And it was all demonic spirits that was behind the scene. And today, today, all of those bags that you saw, God took it. She's free. You know, like the woman at the well, like leave her even. She didn't even go back home with her partner. You know? she, <laughs> she left. She left the water pot and go back. <laughs> right? She's free today. Anybody else in this room? I want you to put shame. I want you to put embarrassment. I want you to put pride. Everything as I. Anybody else in this room that experienced panic attack? I want you to come right now. Anybody else that have any experience with panic attack, sometimes out of the blue, come right now. Now! Stand right here. Today is the last day. Bring me, bring me that oil, please. Thank you, Father. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over my sister. Thank you, Father. Hon, I want you to just rest your hand. Anywhere the Spirit would have you to do that, just rest your hand on her. Father, I thank you for your presence that is in this room right now. Your presence is a presence that gives life. It's a presence that brings light. It's a presence that brings hope. It's a presence that brings peace. It's a presence that brings comfort. It's a presence 
that brings the very life of who you are. And Father, we know that it is greater than anything that Satan is capable of doing. And Father, the enemy has set up a whole lot of stuff because he has studied the human and his intent is to steal, kill, and destroy. But you sent your son that we might have life and have it more abundantly. As I lay my hands upon her today, Father, I take authority over these spirits that has been operating behind the scenes against her life for years and has been trying to destroy her, literally destroy her. Today, I release you from this bondage. I say Say to you, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. I rebuke the spirit of lie. I rebuke the spirit of bondage. I rebuke the spirit of oppression. And I say to you, you are free. You are free. You are free. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Father, you told us in your word that when we lay hands on the sick, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whether it's emotional or whatever, they shall recover. So right now in the name of Jesus, I agree with you that when you walk out of this room, you are leaving all of this baggage that God didn't give to you. He didn't give you the spirit of fear. He gave you the spirit of power. He gave you the spirit of love. He gave you the spirit of a sound mind, a balanced mind, a disciplined mind, the mind of Christ. Be free. Father, thank you. Thank you. Spirit. Lying spirit. Lying spirits. Lying spirits. You have no more access to her mind from this day forward I eject you I cut you off I dismantle I pull up I root up I tear down I destroy in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ the sword of the spirit is the word of God I release the word right now to cut off to sever in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you are a son of God you are redeemed you are the righteousness of of God in Christ Jesus. You are a son and you have no right. You have no right carrying this. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. As I lay my hands upon you my brother. I command the devil. I command the devil to hear me and hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me clear. Hear me loud. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your access to his life has been revoked. Immediately. 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 Instantly. I command you to take your hand off his body right now. Off his life right now. He doesn't belong to you. There is a new seal. There is a new seal. There is a new seal. And Father, I thank you for the seal of the Holy Spirit. And so I command you to be free. I command you to be free because the Lord Jesus Christ makes you free. And whom the Son set free is free indeed be free. He didn't give you the spirit of fear. He gave you the spirit of power. He gave you the spirit of power. He gave you the spirit of love. He gave you the spirit of a sound mind. You have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. You are not going to get the mind of Christ. You are not looking for the mind of Christ. You have 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 the mind of Christ. You you have the mind of Christ. Be free. Be free. Be free.
I have given you power. I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing, nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing, 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 nothing shall by any means, nothing shall by any means hurt you. We believe that, Father. We believe that. We believe that. We believe that. We believe that and we receive it in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Father, thank you for the ministry of the word. Thank you for the ministry of the spirit. Thank you for the impartation. 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 I am justified. I am the just. I am the righteous. I am, I am. I freely receive it. And Father, thank you for mindsets that are being shifted. Thank you for strongholds that have been dethroned. Thank you for strongholds that have been dismantled and have been torn down. Father, I have the mind of Christ, therefore I must think the thoughts of Christ. Father, I have the mind of Christ. Did you hear that? Father, I have the mind of Christ, therefore I must think the thoughts of Christ. I have the mind of Christ, therefore I must think the thoughts of Christ. I speak like Christ. I act like Christ. I am like Christ. Christ is the model son. He is the firstborn. He is the first fruit. I am a son of God. I have the mind of Christ. I think like Christ. I speak like Christ. I act like Christ. Declare it again. I have the mind of Christ. I think like Christ. I speak like Christ. I act like Christ. I am like Christ. So be it. Thank you, Father. As we go from this place, Father, I thank you for what we are leaving with. That we came in, we heard, we receive, and a deposit has been made. A credit has been added to our account. Father, we are receiving it. You know, there are two ways that if you set up, if you have an email that's connected to your online account, someone can do an e-transfer, electronic transfer, right? There's two ways. If you did not set up, go into your account and set up auto, auto, right? Deposit. When they send you, you're going to get a notification by email or by text that you have received an e-transfer. You have received an e-transfer, but did you get it yet if you didn't have auto deposit? You have to now go in, because it sits there for a period of time, and if you didn't, you even get some reminders. Remember, remember. And you have to go in there, open it, and then when you click on it, a link open up with banks. You choose the bank that you have your account with. And if the person now sending it, they have a password that is set up. What they would do, if the password is something that you would quickly recognize, you don't need to ask them or they don't need to text it to you. You enter the password, and once you enter the password, you click deposit. And what, what happened? The moment you click deposit, what happened? It's now in your account. That's what God did when you come to faith in Christ. He sent you a faith link. <laughs> you need to click on it. <laughs> and you need to make sure that you receive it to your account. Receive it to your account. The just shall live by faith. I love you. I bless you. Enjoy the rest of the week. Tomorrow is family day, so we have long weekend. Some of us have to go to work. We'll pray for you, and, and we will remember you while we're having a little bit of a fun. 
but enjoy the weekend and remember, leave this room today knowing that you had opened the link and you click deposit. And you know what the password is? You know what the password is? <laughs> Hallelujah. So you have it in your account. Keep it. The just shall live by faith. So tomorrow, you're going to continue to believe that. Tuesday, you're going to continue to believe that. Wednesday, you're going to continue to believe that. Even when your mind is attacked, you open your mouth and you declare it. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And when I see you again Sunday, you're still saying what? You're not just saying that you shall live by faith. What are you supposed to be confessing? I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Personalize it. Hone it. It's yours. So, the last thing I'll ask you to do as, we, as the camera, the streaming come to an end, those of you that are watching from all over, I love you, I bless you, I, I hug you, and God's willing, we will see you Sunday coming as we continue to unlock this thing. It's getting deeper, but we're going to go as deep as it gets. So until then, blessings to you, and I really love you. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person, the left, the right, in front of you. And I, I, I feel like I want to tell you to find about 15 person, 15 to 20 person, and give them a hug. And tell them this is from Pastor.